Let's start off with what heat energy is all about. In the 1600s and 1700s, or what is known as the Little Ice Age, Europe experienced very low temperatures. Keeping warm was very important, and as a result, many people devoted themselves to the study of heat. One result was the invention of machines that use energy to produce by burning fuel to do useful work. These machines freed society from its dependence on energy produced by people and animals. As inventors tried to make these machines more powerful and more efficient, they developed the science of thermodynamics, it's the study of heat energy, because their atoms are still moving. By the way of definition, heat is a form of energy. It is produced in an object due to continuous and rapid movement of its atoms and molecules hitting each other and other objects. When the temperature of a body increases, its atoms and molecules move faster. And when the temperature of a body falls, then the speed of its atoms and molecules reduces. For example, when you heat up a pan of water, the heat from the stove causes the molecule in the pan to vibrate faster, causing the pan to heat up. The heat from the pan causes water molecules to move faster and heat up. So when you heat something up, you are just making it molecule move faster. The law of conservation of energy, which states that energy cannot be created nor destroyed, but can be changed from one form to another. Since heat is a form of energy, this law also applies to heat. Therefore, heat cannot be created nor destroyed. Heat can be produced by converting some other form of energy. Heat can only be lost if it is transferred to some other object or converted to some other forms of energy. We now turn our attention to sources of heat energy. Many different types of energy can be converted into heat energy. Let us take a look at some examples. One, mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is converted into heat energy whenever you bounce a ball. Each time the ball hits the ground, some of the energy of the ball's motion, that is kinetic energy, is converted into heating up the ball, causing it to slow down at each bounce. Other ways of converting mechanical energy to heat energy are friction, distortion, and compression. So by way of friction, for example, if you rub your palms together, friction generates heat in your palms. Electrical energy. Let's see how electrical energy is used. Electrical energy is widely used as a source of heat. For example, it is used to operate a lot of electrical appliances such as electric iron, kettles, stoves, and hair dryers, etc. Chemical energy from food we eat is also converted into heat in our bodies. Oil, natural gas, wood, and dried vegetation or animal matter or burn, converting chemical energy into heat. Also, a burning match converts chemical energy into heat. Heat refers to the total kinetic energy of a material, whilst temperature, on the other hand, is the measure of the average or apparent energy of molecular motion. In other words, heat is energy, whilst temperature is a measure of energy. Adding heat will increase a body's temperature, whilst removing heat will lower the temperature of the body. In thermodynamic equations, heat is a quantity of energy which may be transferred between two systems. In contrast, both temperature and internal energy are state functions. Heat is measurable as temperature, but it is not a material. 
we don't look at modes of heat transfer. We feel heat from the sun, even though it is thousands of kilometers away from the earth. Heat flows through metal handles of a pan place on a fire or on a hot stove. A pan containing cold water placed on fire begins to warm up and soon begins to boil throughout the whole volume of the water. A hot beverage kept in the vacuum flux will remain hot after a couple of hours. And I believe you've experienced this. You use a thermos flux at home. When the hot liquid is poured from the flask into a metal mug, the liquid soon cools to the temperature of the surrounding air. To understand why some containers lose heat more easily than others, as well as other everyday occurrences related to heat, you have to study how heat is transferred. Heat energy moves naturally from a warm place to a cool place. This movement is called heat transfer. There are three ways to transfer heat from one place to another or through a substance. And these are by conduction, convection, and radiation. In this lesson, you will study all three methods of transferring heat. Let's start with heat transfer by conduction. Heat transfer is the passage of heat energy from a hot to a cold object. For example, if you hold an iron rod with one end in flame, before long, the rod becomes too hot to hold. Heat is transferred from the hot end to the cold end by a process known as conduction. Conduction of heat takes place within materials and between different materials that are in direct contact until there is a thermal equilibrium in material or between the different materials. This means for conduction to take place, there must be temperature difference between different parts of a material or between different materials that are in contact. Thus, heat transfer always occurs from a hot body to a cold one. Heat transfer can never be stopped. It can only be slowed down. In heat transfer, no part of the material moves bodily from one part to another. Now let's look at definition of conduction. Conduction is the transfer of heat through a material from regions of higher temperature to regions of lower temperature but without the transfer of any of the material from a hotter to a colder part. Mechanism of heat transfer. So we are looking at the mechanism of heat transfer by conduction. Consider an iron rod placed in a flame. In a short time, the other end of the rod also becomes heated. The explanation is that the conduction by the iron rod can be explained by collision between atoms or molecules and the action of loosely bound electrons. When the molecules near the source of heat take some heat, their internal energy increases. This increases their kinetic energy, and as a result, they vibrate more violently. Each molecule transfers some of its kinetic energy to its neighboring molecule during collision, making them also vibrate faster. These neighboring molecules also transfer kinetic energy to the next neighboring molecules. Thus, heat energy is transferred from one end of the material. The molecules themselves do not move from one region of the material to another, but their energy does. Heat transfer occurs only between regions that are at different and the direction of heat flow is always from higher to lower temperatures. The atoms in a substance are always vibrating. When heat is applied to a substance, the heat energy is given to the atoms and they vibrate and move faster and so their kinetic energy 
increases. The vibrating atoms bump into each other, that is the neighboring atoms, and pass on their kinetic energy. These atoms then pass their kinetic energy to atoms closer to them, and so on. In this way, the heat energy moves through the substance. Conduction takes place in solids, liquids, and gases, but works best in solids as their atoms or molecules are located closer together. Metals are the best solids for conducting heat. Metals have tightly packed atoms which can easily pass on their kinetic energy and also have free moving electrons. These electrons can move from the hot part of the metal to the cold part, transferring the heat energy to the cold part more quickly. Now let's look at conductors and insulators. Good conductors. A substance is said to be a good conductor of heat if it allows heat to pass through it easily. We also have bad conductors of heat. These are materials which do not allow heat to pass through them easily. We also have good and bad conductors. The rate at which materials conduct heat vary. It is greatest for metallic solids, lower for non-metallic solids, very low for liquids, and extremely low for gases. The best ordinary metallic conductors are silver, copper, gold, aluminum, beryllium, and tungsten. Examples of bad conductors are plastics, rubber, glass, cotton wool, felt, wood, the human body, etc. Conduction does not occur at all in a perfect vacuum. Bad conductors of heat are also called insulators. Now let's look at an experiment to determine the conductivities of solids. The setup consists of a small tank with rods of aluminum, brass, copper, and wood attached to one side of it, as shown on your screen. The rods have the same cross-sectional area with one end of each coated with paraffin wax. The tank is then filled with hot water and the rate at which the wax melted was observed. When equilibrium was reached, it was observed that wax melted on the rods started with copper, followed by brass, iron, glass, and finally wood. Since the wax melted at different rates, the experiment shows that metals conduct heat at different rates. This experiment also shows that metals are good conductors of heat, whilst other solid substances are bad conductors of heat. Experiment to show that water is a bad conductor of heat is the next item we are moving on to. A piece of ice is wrapped in a wire gauze and placed at the bottom of a test tube. The test tube is filled with water to about three quarters full. The water at the top is heated. While the water at the top is boiling, the ice at the bottom remains unmelted. The hot water at the top is less dense and remains at the top. It cannot move to the bottom of the test tube. This means heat from the upper part of the test tube is not conducted to the bottom of the test tube as shown on your screen. This shows that water is a bad conductor of heat since it could not conduct the heat from the upper part to the lower end of the test tube. We now look at application of heat transfer by conduction. Good conductors are used to transfer heat, whilst poor conductors are used to prevent loss of heat. All metals are good conductors of heat and are therefore used to make cooking utensils, car engines, boilers, etc. Heat insulation is the next item we are considering. Poor conductors or insulators are used in reducing heat transfer or heat loss. 
For example, the handles of cooking utensils are made of insulators to prevent heat from reaching the hand. Asbestos are used as roofing sheets. Wood and sawdust are used to cover blocks of ice to prevent them melting quickly. Materials which trap air, example wood, felt, fur, feathers, polystyrene, fiberglass are used as lugging to insulate water pipes, ovens, refrigerators, roofing, and walls. The double wood wall offices contain air spaces which prevent heat from entering the offices. We don't turn our attention to heat transfer by convection. In the first method of heat conduction, we have learned that heat can be transferred within bodies and between different bodies that are in direct contact. Conduction occurs not only within a body, but also between two bodies if they are brought into contact and if one of the substance is a fluid, that is liquid or gas, then fluid motion takes place. This process of conduction between solid surface and a moving liquid or gas is called convection. For example, air in contact with a hot body rises and warms the region above the hot object. Another example is water in a beaker. When the beaker is heated from below, heat from the bottom of the beaker soon reaches the upper surface of the water. Now let's look at convection in liquids. Convection in liquids can be demonstrated by dropping a small crystal of potassium permanganate down the center of a flux containing water. When the flux is gently warmed at the center of the base, purple streak will rise gently from the slowly dissolving crystal. This indicates that warm water at the center of the flux is rising. As the heating is continued, the coloring starts to move down near the outside of the flux. These streams of warm moving liquid are called conventional currents. How does the heat get to the upper surface of the water is what I need you to think about. When a flux is heated, the water molecules directly above the flame start to move faster and further apart. The extra space between the molecules make the warm water less dense than the cool water around it. As a result, the warm water floats upward. The cool water moves in to take its place, but soon is warmed up too. The result is a continuous upward movement of water directly above the flame. The moving water is called conventional current. Heat transfer by conduction involves the transfer of energy from molecule to molecule. Energy moves, but the molecules do not move. However, in convection, the molecules move throughout the volume of the fluid, carrying the heat energy with them. So you now see the difference between conduction and convection. Let's now look at convection in gases. Convection in gases may be demonstrated by using the apparatus on your screen. It consists of a box with a glass front and two chimneys fixed at the top. A lighted candle is placed under one of the chimneys and a smoothing piece of rope is held above the chimney and passed through the box up the other chimney as shown on your screen. From our discussion so far, we can now define convection. It is the flow of heat through a fluid from a place of higher temperature to a place of lower temperature by movement of the fluid. Let's now turn our attention to types of convection. Convection occurs in two forms. That is the natural convection and the forced convection. In natural convection, fluid surrounding 
a heat source receives heat, becomes less dense, and rises. The surrounding cooler fluid then moves to replace the heated one that has moved up. This cooler fluid is then heated and the process continues forming a convection current. Natural convection is due to the non-uniformity of fluid temperature in the presence of a gravitational field. For example, the formation of winds over the surface of the earth is due to natural convection. Forced convection occurs when pumps, fans, or other means are used to propel the fluid and create an artificial induced convection current. Forced convection is achieved by subjecting a fluid to a pressure gradient and thereby forcing motion to occur. In some heat transfer systems, both natural and forced convection contribute significantly to the rate of heat transfer. We now move on to applications of convection current in fluids, starting with natural convection. Natural convection is used in refrigerators. The freezer is placed at the top of the refrigerator so that cold air falling downwards may set up a circulation in the cabinet. Natural convection current over the Earth's surface is what we are turning our attention to. Cloud formation is the first one we are looking at. Convection current over the Earth's surface carry warm, moist air upwards where it expands and cools. If the air cools below its dew point, then drops of water condense forming a cloud. We now look at winds. Convection current, stirring the atmosphere, produce winds. This term is usually applied to the natural horizontal motion of the atmosphere. Winds are produced by differences in atmospheric pressure, which are primarily attributable to differences in temperature. Variation in the distribution of pressure and temperature are caused largely by unequal distribution of heat from the sun together with the differences in the thermal properties of land and ocean surfaces. When the temperature of adjacent regions become unequal, the warmer air tends to rise and flow over the cold, heavier air. This movement of air over the surface of the earth is called wind. Another natural condition we want to consider is sea breeze. Have you been to the seashore before? Did you notice any sea breeze? During the day, the sun shines on the land and warms it. The warm land then heats the air above it. As the air is heated, it expands and becomes less dense and rises. Cooler, denser air above the water moves towards the shore to take the place of the rising warm air. This results in convection current that causes an onshore breeze known as sea breeze. The illustration on your screen explains the mechanism. So when the land is heated, the air above the land gets heated. It becomes less dense and it rises. As it moves up, the colder air on the surface of the water, that is the sea, moves to the land to take the place of the hot air that has moved up. And this forms a cyclical motion of air, which we refer to as sea breeze. At night, the sea, because of its higher specific heat capacity, has much more heat to lose than the Earth's surface, and it therefore cools more slowly than the Earth. The air above the sea is therefore warmer than the air above the land. The warmer air above the sea expands and becomes less dense. It then moves upwards. Cooler, denser air above the land moves away from the shore to take the place of 
the warm air that has risen from the surface of the sea. This results in a convection current causing an offshore breeze called land breeze. So in that case, air rather moves from the land to the sea, whilst the air on the sea rises up because of its warmer nature and less dense. Let's now look at ventilation. Ventilation is the supplying of fresh air to a room or a building or any living place. When the air in a room becomes warm, it rises and escapes through the ventilation holes higher up in the walls or in the ceilings. The cool, heavier air enters the room through the windows to replace the warm air that has moved up. This sets up a convection current in the room. The convectional current in the room helps to increase the evaporation of sweat from our bodies, thereby reducing discomfort. Because of this idea, it is incumbent upon you to make sure you keep windows to a room open so as to enhance ventilation in the room. Because you now know that there is some natural convection current happening in the room. In tropical countries, windows should therefore be placed down near the floor and ventilation spaces should be placed high up in the roof or in the walls. Now let's turn our attention to our third and final method of heat transfer, that is radiation. Heat from the sun is able to pass through the atmosphere and warm the Earth's surface. This heat does not pass through the atmosphere by conduction, for air is one of the poorest conductors. Nor does it pass through by convection, for convection begins only when after the Earth is warmed. We also know that neither conduction nor convection is possible in the empty space where there is no molecules between our atmosphere and the sun. Heat must be transmitted by another process. This process is radiation. Heat radiation does not require material medium for the transfer of heat energy. Any energy, including heat, that is transmitted by radiation is called radiant energy. We now look at radiant energy in the form of electromagnetic waves. This includes radio waves, microwaves, infrared radiation, visible light, ultraviolet radiation, X-rays, and gamma rays. Radiation is the transfer of heat energy from one place to another by means of electromagnetic waves. You have experienced heat transfer by radiation if you have ever stood near an open fire. You can feel the heat on your exposed hands and surface. The diagram on your screen illustrates the three methods of heat transfer. Visible radiation is emitted from burning material, but most of the heating effect comes from the invisible infrared radiation emitted by the glowing body. You feel this radiation because it is absorbed by water molecules in your skin. Radiation is emitted by all bodies above absolute zero and consists mostly of infrared radiation. But light and ultraviolet light are also present if the body is very hot. Heat radiation does not require material medium for the transfer of heat energy. Infrared radiation is very important in maintaining our planet's warmth by a mechanism known as the greenhouse effect. Experiments show that heat radiation is transmitted like light. It can be reflected, refracted, and focused. Heat radiation travels 
with the speed of light. That is 3.0 times 10 raised to the power 8 meters per second. Radiant heat plays a very important role in our lives. Let us look at the absorption and emission of radiant heat and their uses. The diagram on your screen shows how different modes of heat transfer takes place between the atmosphere and the earth during the day. So as you can see on your screen, we have the sun giving off its heat, radiating the heat onto the earth. The earth conducts the heat from one material to the other, especially solids, that is the, the earth, sand, stones, all those materials. The earth gets heated, the air above the earth gets warmed, and the heat is sent up by convection into space. So whilst the sun to the earth is radiation, in the earth, the solid materials is conduction. Then the heated air rises by convection. Now let's turn our attention to the vacuum flux, one of the very common materials we use at home, especially when it comes to breakfast. A vacuum or a thermos flux keeps hot liquids hot or cold liquids cold. It is very difficult for heat to travel into or out of the flux. Radiation is reduced by silvering the inner surfaces of the glass, since smooth metal surfaces are poor radiators and good reflectors. Thus, when hot liquids are stored, the hot surface will not radiate much heat, and most of the heat that is radiated across the vacuum will be reflected back again by the silver on the other surface. The vacuum prevents heat losses from hot liquid inside by conduction and convection. The plastic stopper prevents heat losses from the liquid by convection. It also prevents conduction of heat from the glass. Well, my dear students, in summary for this lesson, we learn about heat energy and the different ways by which it can be transferred. We also looked at some experiments to demonstrate the various modes of heat transfer. We learned about how heat transfer is used to explain some natural phenomenon such as land and sea breeze. All too soon, my dear students, we've come to the end of this lesson, but I believe you've been educated. It's been hot, it's been heated, but all the issues will require additional studying, solving the questions that comes with the lesson and being focused on the issues under discussion. Keep reading until I come across you again another time. Have a blessed day.